we're diving into some history that you might not know much about. Have you ever heard of Freedman's Towns or All Black Towns? You kind of get an idea from the name. Freedmen and people formerly enslaved who were emancipated during and after the Civil War set up these towns in a number of states, most notably Oklahoma and Texas. Now, we're talking about Freedman's Towns today because they're the focus of a new original documentary from Newsy premiering this weekend. Ropes in Brown Hands. It's about a historic African-American rodeo in the old Freedman's town of Bowley, Oklahoma. Here's a sneak peek of that doc. I like rodeos where I can hook up the trailer and be 10, 15 minutes away from the house. <sighs> Show up at the rodeo, everybody knows you, everybody knows your name, you're all family there. Now there's CJ. And little CJ is here. Some of the cowboys and cowgirls that decided to come on down. These are the original cowboys right there. We all came from the same area to come up here and compete with each other. We had to do it every weekend in just a new place. Bobby and the boys, one of our relay teams right there. Glad to have him here. They told me there were no horses, but I see some cowboys. The town was uh, founded in 1903 by a couple of people working on the Smith and Western Railroad. When they were here working on the railroad, there were people that were living in this area because this was Indian Territory. This was before Oklahoma was Oklahoma. Some of them were freedmen. And the men were working on the railroad and they thought, well, this could be a town. What about black folk governing themselves? And people, were, black people were coming from all over the world into this, maybe they thought it was a utopia. There are 13 left of the original black towns. Black in Indian Territory, there were probably about 50 all black towns that just sprung up in Oklahoma. Here to help us better understand the history of Freedman's Towns is Hannibal B. Johnson, an attorney, consultant, college professor, and author with strong roots in Oklahoma. Hannibal, thank you so much for joining us on In The Loop. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Um, so let's lay the foundation for our audience here. Um, very simply, what are Freedman's Towns and where are they located? So Oklahoma is actually the site of a number of all black towns. In fact, more all black towns than any other state in the union. And this happens in part because of the ways that black folks ended up in what is now Oklahoma. So many people don't understand that there's a connection between the black community here in Oklahoma generally and Native Americans. And that connection goes all the way back to the forced removal of the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Muscogee Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Seminoles out of the Southeastern United States into what is now Oklahoma's Indian territory then. All five of those tribes engaged in the practice of chattel slavery. So they had black people living among them who were enslaved, but they also had some black, free black folks living among them as well. So the first kind of major wave of the black population in Oklahoma comes with the so-called five civilized tribes, again, in the 1830s and 1840s. And then later in the 1800s, the late 18, and during the 1880s, there was a movement afoot in Oklahoma called boosterism, whereby African-Americans who had come to Oklahoma in the land runs and land lotteries began promoting Oklahoma as a desired destination for, for uh, African-Americans who were oppressed in the Deep South and Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, et cetera. Going back to the language of it all, you, you don't use Freedman towns. You say all black towns. Why is, why is that language uh, distinction important for you? Because most of, most of the, the all black towns were populated by a mixture of folks. Some of the folks had ties, blood affinity, or other ties, treaty ties to the five civilized tribes. Some of the black folks had no connection to those, those tribes, even though they were in a town that was formed around an allotment awarded to a black person. So, you know, some of the towns certainly had a populace uh, that, uh, that included freedmen, and freedmen is a word that really uh, designates Black folks who have, again, these ties, treaty, affinity, or blood ties to the so-called five civilized tribes. 
Um, but again, other people in Oklahoma who are black arrived not because of the, 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 their relationship to the five tribes, but rather because they responded to the calls of boosters who were touting Oklahoma as a kind of land of milk and honey, a place of opportunity, very different from the deep south where black folks were uh, oppressed in open and obvious ways. Only 13 of the more than 50 all black towns that were settled in Oklahoma still exist today. Um, kind of fast forwarding a bit, what happened to these all black towns and why are so few of them um, still in existence right now? A lot of macro economic dynamics occurred that really doomed the all black towns. First and foremost is the transition from an agrarian society to industrial society. Most of these towns were formed between 1890 and 1910. They were, they were often centered on agrarian pursuits and had, had really sm relatively small populations. So it's really hard for them to transition into the industrial economy. The depression, the recession in the 20s and the, re and the depression in the 30s doomed many small towns and really devastated many of the all black towns. The other thing that, that's going on during this period is that these towns are small, they have young people. Some of these towns have schools and they're educating their, their young people in the communities. But the young people tended not to return to the towns once they, once they reached maturity. So they wanted to be in larger, larger places and spaces, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, et cetera. And so that's another sort of negative factor in terms of the ability of the towns to sustain themselves. Yet another factor is the misallocation or the inequitable allocation of infrastructure dollars. So a lot of these towns were not getting their fair share of things like uh, roads and sewer systems and sanitation systems and, and so forth. That made them less hospitable uh, to, to residents who might otherwise want to locate there. Yeah, so this kind of leads into um, a pretty important question here. Um, how do you, as an expert and a historian, think um, we should preserve these towns? I mean, is it is it kind of going the route of, um, you know, making these towns more attractive for tourists or, you know, how, how exactly, what's the best way to go about preserving some of these places? Yeah, well, the towns are uh, in many ways historic artifacts. And I say that because of the 13 remaining towns, they're, they're all small towns. Um, there's still a great difficulty with, with getting young people to remain in town once they reach, reach maturity. What is an option, and what, you, what is something that is, is feasible is to help other folks, not just in the state, but, but around the nation and in the world, understand the history of these towns and understand their cultural significance. And there is a national movement toward heritage and cultural tourism where people want to see living history. So that creates an economic opportunity for these towns through collaboration of creating an experience that is of value such that they can reap economic benefit from cultural and heritage tourism. And they can use that, that economic windfall to upgrade facilities in the town, create a better experience, not just for the tourists, but for the people who choose to, to continue to live in those towns. Hannibal B. Johnson is the person that you're going to want to speak to if you're visiting any of these all-black towns in Oklahoma. He's an attorney, a consultant, a college professor, an author who has written about the black experience extensively in Oklahoma. Hannibal, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. So our original documentary, Ropes in Brown Hands, which you saw a bit of earlier, centers around one of these old Freedman's towns, one of the last still surviving. Now, we couldn't show you a snippet of that doc without bringing in the producer behind it. Joining us now is Newsy documentary producer and good friend of ITL, Alexandra Travis. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Christian. Yes, of course, of course. So we know that 
the Yeehaw agenda is strong, but it's been around <laughs> for a while, right? How did you hear about Bowley and the annual rodeo? I got an email um, just of, of a keyword that was mentioned in a recent article. And looking into that, um, I started reading about black towns and freedmen's towns and how Oklahoma had the most in the country. And this is something I didn't really hear about or learn about growing up. Um, so I wanted to learn more and learn what the culture is like in these surviving black towns. Um, and that brought me to Bowley, who is the largest in Oklahoma and the biggest part of their culture is the rodeo. Um, and from all the videos and photos that I ended up watching, it just looked like such a warm atmosphere. It reminded me of family reunions. Um, and it just all kind of worked out to something that we wanted to explore a little bit more. Yeah. And we do that through CJ. He is our uh, main character for all intents and purposes. Um, and you know he's a great person to kind of learn through um kind of a conduit if you will um what was it about cj that made it clear that he would be the contestant that you all would be following throughout the piece so as soon as i talked to cj i pretty much knew that he was going to be the person i'd want to follow um people pointed me in his direction because he'd won the rodeo before he's come in second um and when I got on the phone with him and we started talking about what the rodeo meant to him, it was clear that it's something that means a lot to him and his family and something that he's been doing for a really long time. So he just seemed like the expert on the subject pretty much. Um, and he's so ingrained in rodeo culture. As you see in the piece, he really wants to continue his rodeo career. His family hosts their own annual rodeo every year um, around the 4th of July. So. There was just, it just made sense. And plus, uh, you know, I didn't know this until after we were there, but once we got there, it was so obvious that CJ is just a natural on camera. Um, so it just worked out perfectly. And I've never seen someone connect to animals and talk about their horse as really a partner in something the way CJ does. And I thought that was interesting. CJ is such a compelling guy to watch throughout this piece. And it's almost like, I don't know, you, you get to know him in such an intimate way because he's bringing everybody yeah. in. It's exactly what you'd want as an audience member. But CJ isn't the only person that we hear from throughout uh, Ropes and Brown Hands. We also hear another voice. Um, it's, a, it's a person reading a poem. Can you talk about why you chose to incorporate that into the piece? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the poem that you hear throughout is called The Bully Rodeo, um, and it was written by Marilyn Nelson, who is a very distinguished and awarded poet. Basically, the inspiration behind the poem um, was Marilyn, her mother is from Bully, and she ended up hearing about the Bully Rodeo, had never been or anything growing up, and went, um, I believe, back in 2019 or 2018, and from there was inspired to write this poem, The Bully Rodeo. We thought that it would be invaluable to have the perspective of someone who was there in the stands and who has such a familial tie to the place. And we could tell that the Bully Rodeo was something really special to her. And after we went, we only felt that her words summed, summed it up perfectly. Yeah, it's almost like the poem, you know, was the perfect way to uh, help craft the story. You know, it, it inspired the title of this documentary. Um, Newsy documentary yeah. producer and good friend of ITL, Alexandra Travis, uh, I appreciate you as always. Thanks so much for chatting with us a little bit about this piece. Thank you for having me. I always appreciate it.